Okay, so now let's talk about a cochlear implant. Why might you use this instead of a hearing aid? Well, because you're not using hair cells, right? This is actually taking place of hair cells. The cochlear implant becomes the hair cells. So if you have had some sort of ototoxic drug and the hair cells have died um, in a profound way, then you can use a cochlear implant to take place of the hair cells. Some people have this congenitally. There's no hair cells. But there is still a cranial nerve, the eighth cranial nerve, the auditory nerve. And so we can use the, uh, the electrode of the cochlear implant to then act like the hair cells that they never had. So here's a sort of idea of what's going on. Again, this requires surgery. Um, this is not a great picture. But you have an electrode that travels down uh, through the bone into the inner ear. It's going to go in through the oval window. So it's actually coming in through the middle ear. And then it's going to go in through the oval window right here that the stapes usually uh, pounds up against. And you're going to then snake it through the cochlea. And these electrodes on the end of this uh, just kind of release little little shocks. Choop, choop, choop. And what that does is it causes neurons up the chain in the nerve uh, to fire. And that creates the perception of sound. Um, this is all in the head. This is all implanted surgically. Uh, and then it comes up here um, to the... This is a really strange depiction of it. But this should come out on the outside of the skull here. And then sit underneath the skin. This is not another magnet that kind of sits on just like the uh, bone conduction device that we looked at earlier. So, um, yeah, let's move on to take a look at some of these. Here's just a few, you know, for you to see. This is going to sit behind the ear. It's going to capture the sound here and it's going to come through this and it's going to be transmitted through this this is the part that sits inside the person. Uh, so this is going to not, not come in contact with this part right here. These two round parts, they don't come in contact with each other, but they, they sit right on top of each other. This is the magnet. This is a plate that holds on to the magnet. This is going to uh, accept the frequency with uh, radio frequency. And then that's going to be transmitted. Actually, sorry. Yeah. That's right. And so then this is going to transmit down through this um, electrode here until we get down here. And this is where this is going to make contact with uh, the cochlea right here. So this little spiral part is going to go into the cochlea. We're going to take a look. Yeah, there we go. So these little black areas, those are the actual electrodes that are going to send out the little shocks. Um, that cause the neurons to fire. So placement is extremely important. If we have good placement, if the electrodes are um, right up on the, uh, on the neurons that they need to be, if they're right up on the, the eighth cranial nerve, not on the lateral wall all the way out here, then they're going to send out their little shock of electricity and you can see that they're only going to make maybe three neurons fire. If it was hair cells it would just be one neuron because the hair cells are absolutely microscopic. The best we can do is causing a few uh, neurons to fire so frequency resolution isn't the best with cochlear implant technology though we're, we're getting better although between 16 and 20 electrodes is um, about all that's necessary to achieve pretty pretty decent uh, levels of frequency discrimination but anyway um, we can't get as perfect as the hair cells and the closeness of the electrodes to the nerves uh, is 
one of those issues. So you can see if this electrode is all the way out at the lateral wall of the cochlea, this is the spread of excitation from the electrode. It's going to send out its shock and it's going to keep widening as it goes. Think about a spray paint can. If you're right next to the thing that you're spray painting, you get a nice, really concentrated um, bead of paint. If you're really far away, then it's just a mist that goes everywhere. It's the same with this electricity. So we want to make sure that the electrode is right up against um, the, the neurons that it's trying to make fire. All right, here's a actual picture of what's going on. This is a microscopy photo of the cochlea. And this is where we're trying to put the electrode. Millions of people suffer from hearing loss. For those who no longer benefit from hearing aids, cochlear implants may be the next best step. For most people, severe to profound hearing loss results from damage to fine sensory hair cells in the inner ear. A cochlear implant bypasses the damaged hair cells and sends electrical signals directly to the hearing nerve and onto the brain. It all begins with the microphones, which capture sound waves approaching the ear. Then the processor, shown here worn over the ear, converts the sound into digital signals. These signals are sent to the headpiece, which in turn transmits them to the connected implant and onto the inner ear. The hearing nerve receives signals from the implant and sends impulses to the brain, which are interpreted as sound. For people who don't benefit from hearing aids, CI technology makes it possible to perceive sound. The result? A revolutionary restoration of hearing, connecting you or your loved ones to the world of sound. An experience not possible with hearing aids alone. At Advanced Bionics, we're here to help provide a solution. This hearing system from Advanced Bionics is a direct result of 70 years of innovation in hearing technology from Advanced Bionics and Sonova. Those videos are good, but they always remind me of something that would be in like one of those science fiction horror movies where um, it seems good and then something terrible happens. But nothing terrible happens with these. Don't, don't worry. It just seems like that kind of video. Um, all right, so essentially what goes on in the cochlear implant is you have to take an audio signal and then break it apart into its constituent frequencies. Remember we talked about that it's called Fourier transform. Fast Fourier transform is another um, term for it. Um, and we just figure out what frequencies are present in the signal. Well then what we do is we break those down into channels. So we take that picture that I showed you that has you know different representations of frequencies and we chop it and we say these go to uh, the first electrode, these go to the second electrode, and this one goes to the third electrode. So then those are transmitted to the cochlear implant and then different electrodes uh, will fire in different patterns according to uh, the frequencies um, that we've pulled out of that uh, Fourier transform. So what's going on inside the cochlear implant is it's doing a Fourier transform it's figuring out where the uh, peaks of the frequencies are. It's putting those into different categories and then sending those to the different electrodes. All right, so what's the difference between these two things? Well, hearing aids are all acoustic, right? They're amplifying sound, but then they're playing sound into the ear. You're using your typical setup to hear what's there. Co cochlear implants, it's all electrical. It turns it into electrical digital uh, sound outside and then it sends it into your head, into your cochlea, as still electrical signals. And in fact, it then shocks the nerve uh, and only at that point does it turn it into a typical neural signal. Um, you're using your hair cells with a hearing aid, you're not with the cochlear implant because the cochlear implant's taking the place of your hair cells. Um, hearing aids do not require surgery, but cochlear implants do require surgery. 
Um, and then hearing aids aren't good at providing amplification in high frequencies, and they can't account for certain types of distortion. They can't account for any type of distortion, um, but the worse the distortion is, the worse the signal you're going to get. So you can amplify all day long, but if you don't have the hair cells um, to be able to understand what's being amplified, then the hearing aid isn't doing anything for you. The cochlear implant can overcome distortion, uh, some types of distortion, um, because it takes the place of the hair cells. Of course, if you have an acoustic neuroma or some sort of brain damage from TBI, a cochlear implant isn't going to help that either. Everyone is a candidate for a hearing aid. You can get these for any type of hearing loss. Of course, they're going to be they're going to work better depending on your speech processing skills, your speech perception scores, the amount of motivation that you have to use these, and how long you actually use them as well. Um, not everyone is a candidate for a cochlear implant. Um, you can see here that if you have just typical age-related hearing loss, you're not a con you're not a candidate for a cochlear implant. It's a big surgery, um, and again, it doesn't provide as good of frequency discrimination as hair cells. So if you're in this region, if you only have hearing loss, you know, if you're following the outside edge of this green bar and then onto this orange bar, a hearing aid would probably suit you better um, because the cochlear implant isn't, isn't helping you with anything. Down in this area, you might consider it, depending on your, you know, individual tastes, depending on what's going on. And anybody in this green bar would be a candidate for a cochlear implant. So if you have just profound hearing loss, you're a candidate. Or if you have hearing loss in these lower frequencies, which is where speech is usually located, um, our fundamental frequency and first and second formats, uh, sometimes some second formats, not all of them, um, of speech are located in this region. If you have hearing loss in that region, then you're not making a whole lot of sense of what people um, are saying. And so then you're a candidate for a cochlear implant for sure. But of course, again, everyone is a candidate for a hearing aid. So before you make the decision or before your client makes the decision, to get, a hearing, uh, to get a cochlear implant, you can try them out with a hearing aid and see if it works. Um, one thing that we do have to consider when we recommend a cochlear implant is, is the person healthy? Can they take a surgery where something is going to be inserted um, basically into their brain? Uh, it's, not, it's not the brain, it's, it's the cochlea, but it's, it's darn close. Um, I've, I've uh, started talking over my slide already. This is my next thing that I wanted to talk about. So um, we need to have appropriate expectations. You need to make sure that your candidate, your client has appropriate expectations. Know that frequency discrimination isn't going to be as good as they used to have uh, and not as good as with a hearing aid either because you're breaking it down into only a few electrodes. Um, also, they have to have good heart health. The reason for that is they're going to be put, you know, out with anesthesia um, to have this done. And for a little bit of time, they have to be healthy enough to actually stand up to that. So some people with um, certain medical problems, um, people that are just much uh, older people, um, they might not be good candidates for this. Also, some children are... Uh, we want to get them cochlear implants young, the younger the better, but we also have to make sure that they're capable of standing up to the surgery. If you think back to our lecture on cleft palate and cleft lip, that's something that we were worried about there too. We want to get them the surgery, but they have to be healthy enough to be able to withstand the anesthesia and the trauma of the surgery. So it's uh, kind of a game between we want to do this as early as possible, but the early as possible depends on how healthy um, that child actually is. Oh, see, 
<laughs> I just keep, I guess I know this lecture really well. I keep talking about things that I've got slides on already. Um, so uh, other um, candidates for, uh, for children having hearing aids, aside from just being healthy enough to get it, is we have to test them out. We have to make sure that uh, they're not able to hear. We don't want to, you know, implant them with a cochlear implant um, and they don't actually need it. Um, we don't see much of a benefit from hearing aids. Uh, then they would be candidates for cochlear implant. Um, and another thing is, which you're going to hear more about in um, Dr. Rao's lecture, is that the parents have to be okay with uh, having the cochlear implant put in. Sometimes there's two deaf parents or one deaf parent, and uh, they might want their child to be part of that group as well. Uh, there's a whole um, deaf community um, of people, you know, who just are not interested in hearing sound. And so if that's true and they want their child to be involved in that community as well, then, you know, even if we think it's uh, better, we can't force that on the, uh, on the parents. Uh, all right. So this lecture is getting a little long. Let me move to what we want to see here. Okay, yeah, we've got some graphs that I want to show you here. Um, so here is cochlear implant speech perception uh, compared to normal hearing. And you can see that noise is a big problem for cochlear implants. Why is this? Well, it's probably because <laughs> it's, a it's a multiply determined reason. Um, it probably has something to do with the spread of excitation from the electrodes. We're not getting uh, as fine of frequency discrimination with the cochlear implant. There could be some things, uh, if you remember our last, I think it was the most recent lecture we talked about, um, the research I had done, where there is some sort of attentional based uh, changes that can happen uh, with the middle ear uh, that can actually enhance our attention. Uh, and block out sound physically. Uh, with a cochlear implant, this doesn't really happen because you're not using the middle ear. So um, you can see here that normal hearing with uh, percent correct uh, word recognition, um, they're pretty close to 100, not quite. We don't get everything, those of us with normal hearing, but you can see the error bars right here. Error bars are kind of just like a standard deviation and uh, the bar stops at the average and then the average doesn't give you the whole story you also need to know how much variation is expected around the average and that's what the error bar is telling you so normal hearing is about 98 percent but with the error bars it can be a hundred percent that's saying some people are up at a hundred percent the cochlear implant it's about 80 but some people you'd expect as much as 95 but now when we start adding in noise, um, our average drops down to about 55, and then with even more noise, about 35. Uh, but you can see that with normal hearing, we've only dropped about slightly higher than 95. So noise is a big problem with uh, cochlear implants. If you have somebody that works in a noisy environment, a cochlear implant might not be for them. It might not do a whole lot for them. Uh, but if you have somebody that's in a quiet environment, they might benefit from it quite a lot. So this is something called electrical acoustic stimulation. What electrical acoustic stimulation is, is a cochlear implant for high frequencies and a typical hearing aid for low frequencies. If you're wondering how that's possible, because when you put the electrode in, shouldn't it damage the hair cells that's true it does but um, remember that if we're only using electrical uh, stimulation for the high frequencies the high frequencies are at the beginning portion of the cochlea of the cochlea so you can put an electrode in a little ways uh, and not go the rest of the way so that'll damage the hair cells what hair cells remained but that's okay you're using electrical electrical stimulation to uh, stimulate the nerve. 
but if you don't go the rest of the way, you still have hair cells there. So you can use um, typical uh, hearing aids then to amplify the sound um, for the low frequency. So what this is really good at is if you have profound high frequency hearing loss, but then just need a little bit of amplification at the lower end. Remember, typical hearing aids aren't great at boosting high frequencies, um, but cochlear implants are pretty good at boosting high frequencies because they're just made of electrodes. Um, so this is a cool combination type thing. This is a new thing that people have been doing. In fact, you can see this paper is from 2018. And what this is showing you is if you have electrical acoustic simulation on two sides, uh, bilaterally, left and right, you perform much better than if you only have it on one side. It's typical that, it used to be typical, that people who got cochlear implants uh, or electrical acoustic simulation, half of which is a cochlear implant, um, would only do it on one side. Because it's a surgery, it takes a while. Um, they would just do one side. But a lot of research is showing us that it's actually better if you do it on both sides, assuming both ears are affected. Um, if both ears aren't affected, if your left ear is fine, leave it, you know, leave it, leave it like that. Um, but <laughs> if you have uh, the same type of hearing loss in both ears, it's much better to get both ears uh, operated on um, because you can see here that um, this is before the operation. This is just a performance with typical hearing aids. When you get electrical acoustic stimulation only in one ear, um, you perform around 70% uh, uh, word recognition correct. Bilaterally, you're up at 80%. So you're doing much better bilaterally than unilaterally. It's going to make it work um, much better. Uh, this is showing basically the same thing. Two hearing aids is better than one. And then this is showing right here um, that you can't expect to do perfectly when you first get your cochlear implant, when you first start using your hearing aid, any sort of amplification. You're not going to do perfectly right off the bat. This shows that with cochlear implant um, down here, this is years after implantation, there's a steady progression of getting better at understanding how to make sense of sound. So this is word recognition scores again, and it constantly increases. Here again is the cochlear implant and uh, hearing amplification, so the electrical acoustic stimulation. That's a bit better. Uh, you don't have as steep of a learning curve here as you do here. This kind of jumps up jumps up in the uh, jumps up after six months jumps up six months later a slight rise a year after that but then it starts to plateau so there's less of a learning curve with the electrical acoustic stimulation than there is in the cochlear implant category but what's important is that your clients know that they're not going to be perfect with it right off the bat they're not going to be if they did have normal hearing before it's not going to be like a miracle cure where now they're going to be able to hear just like they did uh, when they were a kid again right off the bat it's not true it can take a lot of time even then it might not be back to perfection so they just have to put in time uh, and that's true for all uh, amplification it's true for hearing aids it's true for cochlear implants it's true for cochlear implants and hearing aids it's true for the bone conduction you have to put in the time you have to let your brain get used to what your new uh, sonic world is and the brain will do that but only if you give it the practice that it needs uh, this graph is bigger we're gonna ignore that <laughs> um, and then one of the last things I want to uh, go over is that the younger we can have somebody get a cochlear implant or electrical acoustic simulation or even hearing aids the better the more time that their brain has to mold itself around their new sonic world, the better. Think about learning a new language. We know that if you start learning a new language before age eight, you're much better at it than if you start learning a new language after. This is different for some people, but overall that's true. 
And this is true for getting hearing aids and cochlear implants as well. The earlier you can get them, the better your brain is at reconfiguring itself to uh, what that sound is going to be. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll end here. Um, a lot of devices are moving more towards connectivity, which is like super cool. Um, it used to be that your device would only pick up what came to it. So if you were talking on the phone, you had to like put it on speakerphone. If you were watching TV, you had to just play the TV. But now with Bluetooth and stuff like that, you can just connect your phone to your hearing aid or to your cochlear implant. And then you're not having to deal with anything interrupting the sound between you and it. You can just go right into your phone uh, or you can have your TV connect right to you. You can have your um, computer connect right to you. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. All right. So it's pretty much all the same thing. So let's, uh, we're going to stop here. And our next lecture is going to be, oh, you're going to watch um, Dr. Rao's lecture where she will talk about the deaf community, among other things. All right.